Hey guys, John Loxy here, back with our playthrough of Legend of Mana. So today we're actually going to do the World History Book because it's filled in now. So let's uh, let's do that now. I mean, obviously, if you want to skip this whole episode, go go right ahead. But I do think that the the history book is uh, it's it's kind of crazy when you read it. It's it's uh. Very Yoko Taro-esque, even though he did not work on this thing at all. Uh, let's just... So, yeah, I mean... I don't know how long this video is going to be. Hopefully I can... Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes through everything and, and essentially retcons a lot of the canon. I mean, maybe... It's a different world, and this game is sort of a spin-off, right? It's Seiken Densetsu Legend of Mana, so it may or may not be true. It may be in a different dimension. Who knows? But it's about 72 pages. I'm going to try, if I remember, uh, what I'd probably like to do is have a little mark for... Shit, I don't even know how many you could do of the little, the little timeline things. Um... It's possible you can't, so, I mean, I guess you could just read it on yourself, or by yourself, and, uh, silence me, but, but whatever. Uh, if that's actually something you wanted to do, if, is just read it on your own without watching me read it, um, lparchive.org, that one, uh, Legend of Mana playthrough by Mega64, there is one thing where he does basically this. He goes through the world history, and it's just a bunch of screenshots of this, so... That's something that you are welcome to do, if you so desire. <sighs> Alright, let me take a drink and then we'll we'll jump into this. My voice is feeling a little bit better and I've I've had a little bit of rum before this, although it's worn off by now. So let's uh let's get a little bit more sauced up. Hmm. My art of mana book arrived too, which is kinda crazy considering I ordered it yesterday. Uh, but whatever. Pretty interesting reading a lot of the... Uh, some of the unused stuff and some of the plans. Not as much as I was hoping, but... But, as far as cut, cut content, but good enough. Alright, let's go. Oh man, is it... Um... Alright. I, uh, the beginning, the moon gods, names of stones, moon's name, all of these. Yeah, I might... It doesn't... It doesn't give you a title for each of these, so... A twinkling consciousness... I, I'm just gonna read all of them. Like, we're, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna assume this is kind of a... A... Instead of the titles. We'll just assume this is a complete history. Which it kind of is. A twinkling consciousness became a star which sparkled in the night and banished the darkness. The mana goddess acquired consciousness by gazing into the light of that sun. She made Fadil a great land, but so far an empty one. A little weird, but okay. Because already you're sort of separating the mana goddess from... The star, the sun. Wait, anyway. So the way that these actually came about is... These were essentially notes by one of the designers. If, if uh, according to my... From what I understand from reading, like, uh, you know, create some of the creator interviews, was... Um, one of the guys basically just made a bunch of notes about, like, oh, the history of the world and they were going to reference it, and then one of the other dudes just took these notes and just shoved them into the game. Pretty much verbatim. So, that's why it maybe seems a little crazy, or it will, when we talk about, you know, sentient battleships and stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, not even joking. The Mana Goddess drew, drew beams of six colors from the sun. They became the six moons, each hiding a small deity within. When those gods awoke, 
they played beautiful music and brought fortune to the land of Fadil. The six deities became the moon gods and demanded that the mana goddess name them. So the mana goddess gave each of them a shining stone which filled the air with music. Stars, follow me. Moons, walk with me. And we shall celebrate your names. Trine, merciful god of water. Z, passionate god of fire. Barlin, selfish god of gold. Libyet, hopeful god of wood. Morphus, wealthy god of earth. Gazel, whimsical god of wind. The moon gods rejoiced, and the mana goddess returned to her slumber, becoming the great mana tree. Fadil was left to the whims of the moon gods. The moon gods created land and ocean, trees and flowers, and gave them light and the power to determine their fate. The light became the elemental spirits, riding in the sky. They released bountiful light, and were full of desire to serve the moon gods' will. The moon gods then finally returned to slumber. Then, a beautiful yet powerful beast appeared, awakening the moon gods. The moon gods named this beast of strength and beauty, Flammy. Whenever one of the moon gods would fall asleep, another Flammy would appear. Eventually, Flammies of all six colors came to populate all the land. The moon gods tried to outdo each other in creating beauty. Sometimes they argued, trying to follow the mana goddess's will and create many beasts. But dark, cloud, dark clouds came to Fadil, and the moon gods created greater beasts and set them loose upon the land. The Flammies often quarreled, and the cycle of creation and destruction repeated endlessly. Jack's over there destroying the litter box. The trees withered, and the elemental spirits lost their luster. The land dried up, and soon thereafter, wars began. As the wars dragged on, the powers of the moon gods were lost. The land of Fadil was scarred, and pits to other worlds opened in the wounds. The moon gods peeked into the other world and came to know fear, envy, and desire. A little weird. Kind of like what we saw in the beginning, where the, the earth itself was like, you know, getting like chunks taken out and turning into artifacts. Uh, yeah, I mean... You could say that's because of war, but who knows? The whole fabric of reality is flexible. Cracks appeared in the mana tree. Waves of chaos from other worlds came and tried to envelop all of Fadil. Each moon god chose a flammy and gave it a stone. The flammies rode into the sky. They were born of the earth to ride in the sky and return to the earth. They became a flying river of mana. Fadil was filled with the power of mana. It healed itself and shut away the other world. The Flammies returned to the moon gods but could not find them. The moon gods had lost their memories and became beasts. The six remaining Flammies cried in anguish and despair. The waves in the air settled and created many thought forms. Yeah, we're already, we're already starting to get a little weird here, but um, it's fine. It's fine. The Flamies turned their backs on the moon gods and flew into the air. The moon gods turned into stars, and the Flamies never came back down. Wait, I thought the moon gods became beasts. Yes, maybe that's more figurative. Okay, the moon gods turned into stars, and the Flamies never came back down. New concepts came about after the Flamies and the moon gods departed, but the elemental spirits were afraid and prayed to the mana tree, who responded with soft pulses. So, mana goddess created moon gods, moon gods created flammies, and all of them sort of created beasts and there was wars and stuff. They opened up dimensional portals to other dimensions, there was war, then those finally got sealed, the moon gods lost their minds. It's possible the moon gods were referred to as the god beasts that were sealed in the monostones. That's possible from uh, the previous game. Or 
you know, Sega Dead Tetsu 3. So they became beasts, but then they turned into stars, and the Moon Gods, or sorry, Moon Gods turned into stars, the Flammies flew off into space and never came back. And at some point, maybe the Flammies or the Moon Gods had created elemental spirits like, you know, Dryad and Shade and stuff. And so now all that's left is the elemental spirits and the mana tree. Okay. I think we're caught up. These formless beings will eventually be given form so that they might live. They'll be given the task of creating this world. The thoughts they think will shape the landscape. They will be born into this world in fear and sadness. Sometimes their thoughts may hurt this world, but you must help them build it. What is the title of this one? The Prophecy. Okay. Right, the world itself is shaped by the power of thought. In a literal sense, though, not just in a figurative sense. Soon many new beings were born, such as men and fairies. Man used mana to power his creations. Fairies amplified the power of mana with song and dance. Then, from beyond the heavens, six colored beams of light shone down upon the land. Six flammies gazed upon Fadil, and all life there prospered. A new age had begun. The flammies of legend never returned from their heavenly climb. Below, many similar creatures came into being. For example, dragons reflected the flammies divinity, becoming a race of deep introspection. They took it upon themselves to protect Fadil from its many foes. Worms are rumored to be flammies who have fallen into another world. Powerful mages summoned them into this world. Worms possess the incredible powers of the flammies, but they lack their nobility and grandeur. True flammies are said to appear regal and divine, unlike dragons and worms, but no man can truthfully claim to have seen them. You know, they're talking about the dragons, like Akravator and Jajara, presumably, that have said that they're going to protect the world, right? Not the little, little baby dragons that we fought in the underworld. True flammies are said to be regal and divine, unlike dragons and worms. No man can truthfully claim to have seen them. Yeah, they're sort of legendary. In uh, Secret of Mana, Flammy was just a white dragon. And in Sacred Dead Setsu 3, Flammy was presumably one of the main Flammies. I mean, none of this is technically true. It's not canon. But it's still cool. I'm cool with it. I don't know, I'm still trying to, like, link it with all the others, because that's how this was made. This game was made as if it was going to be Seiken Densetsu 4. Humans were destined to reproduce and populate the land, and they developed the technology to build. Soon, they gained dominance over all physical things. The humans who live in this world come in different forms, but they are all humans. Some inherit their forms from their parents, while others are shaped through their experiences. Right. The power of thought can change people. That's why they say if you're not a fairy, you're a human. Fairies have transparent wings, which are not used for flying and are shed during growth. Only young fairies are visible to humans, and their bodies fa fade as time goes on. Eventually, they become completely invisible to the human eye. But Tote also said that we don't see fairies with our eyes. We see them with our thoughts. The mana tree sustained the bond between the world of humans and of fairies. Plants exist in both the human and fairy dimensions. They absorb the mana of Fadil and release it into the atmosphere. Humans use trees for fuel and tools, harnessing... I think that's spelled wrong. Harnessing their power within inanimate objects. Fairies use the mana released by plants to make Fadil a better place. That's racist. <laughs> Speciesist against humans. Although not on par with the fairies, all humans could once harness the ability... Again, harness. All humans could once harness the power of mana. The ability to draw on the power of mana was originally given to all humans equally, but many lost that ability by relying on machines and losing touch with the natural world. Later, 
Those with the power to draw mana were called mages. Technically, our character may be a mage. Our character is extremely special, which we'll see in the Jumi arc. We've already seen it a bit. Uh, Magnolia called us an artificer. The great witch Anise was the first mage to go down in history. Anise bored a hole into the mana tree and built her laboratory there. The flow of mana into both human and fairy worlds was diverted. Anise construct constructed a jewel called the Eye of Flame using the vast amounts of mana in her laboratory. The Firestone brought out the evil in whoever touched it. Very Final Fantasy VII here. Using the actual flow of mana from the tree itself to... You know, as energy. In the Age of Myth, the stones that the Mana Goddess gave to the Moon Gods were the most powerful source of magic known. However, some powerful magic users born in later ages possessed similar stones. Anise tried to obtain such a stone when she created the Eye of Flame, but it was difficult to control and very dangerous. Alright, I'm gonna go back. Um, right, because she constructed the Eye of Flame. <clears throat> so she was trying to create a Mana Stone. Jesus Christ! Excuse me. Unfortunately, alcohol does make me congested, but screw that, I'm gonna keep drinking. Soon, many others learned how to construct their own Eyes of Flame. The waves of mana became chaotic, and shadows clouded the hearts of man. These pulses tore rifts within the dimensions and sent waves of evil into the hearts of man. No longer was all life on the planet descended from the spirits. An age had ended. A world had fallen from its original purity. Evil ruled the land thereafter through men who could control the waves of chaos. Those of truth cried in anguish, but mages, who rejoiced in obtaining new powers, firmly believed this was the world they wanted. The mages declared the beginning of a new thousand-year kingdom and called it the Aeon of Euraclius. Yes. Ion, the leader of the fairies, sent an army to conquer Anise. There, hundreds, hundreds of Anise's mages battled thousands of fairy warriors. The battle was fought overnight, and almost all the fairies were slain. The few remaining fairies continued their lives in the land of man. Right, so we're talking about the fairy war, or the holy war here. Right, because... You know, it's not surprising that basically the fairies were wiped out because the fairies used the power of song and dance to, I don't know, grow plants or something? It didn't say. Whereas the mages were consuming mana to make war, to make weapons, basically. Although the fairies thought that all humans were enemies, they soon discovered that there were those in the land of men who could understand the fairies. With the help of the humans, they were again able to battle Anise and her mages. Eventually, they rose victorious. Unfortunately, during the fight, the mana tree burned to the ground. Yeah, presumably because the mages were ruling over the rest of the humans, which makes sense. Although it was thought that many Eyes of Flame would be recovered from the ashes, only three were found. Ion was banished to the Underworld. He refused to be reincarnated and became the Lord of the Underworld. See, I wonder if this is where they're trying to tie in like Trials of Mana, like Ion is the Dark Prince or the Archdemon. Ion, leader of the fairies. But wait, so Ion... Right, okay. Right, okay, Ion was the fairy leader. I, I don't know, I don't know why Ion was banished to the underworld. Did they say they... 
Okay, so the fairies and the humans beat the mages. Why was Ion banished to the underworld? Because presumably he wanted to rule. That's what revolutionaries want, typically. They don't want freedom, they just want to take over. Alright, so he became the lord of the underworld. Ion, leader of the fairies, created his new servants, the Shadows. Shadows were born from the thoughts of Ion, and they brought the newly departed to the underworld. From this time on, all departed souls are brought to the underworld to receive the judgment of its lord. Okay, that's what they mean when they talk about the king of the underworld judging souls. This is some crazy, crazy stuff. Okay. Anise was killed by a stone called the Seventh Moon. Legend has it that the fairy warrior who fought against Anise, a master of the Eye of Flame in her own right, bested her using this mysterious object. A stone called the Seventh Moon. Presumably a mana stone. That's just what it calls it. But the Eye of Flame is so powerful that it's like a human-created mana stone that immediately corrupts people. After the Holy War of the Mana Tree, the flow of mana to the world resumed. Before, mages would steal from others using dangerous magic, but now the land produced enough for all. However, the surviving mages could not stand being equal to their fellow creatures. They sought magic that could make everything their own. Right. The mages started building towers at mana points all over Fadil in order to regain the Eyes of Flame. They took action against the fairies, who stood in the way of their plans. Whenever a tower was built, an army would come to destroy it. Such wars continued for hundreds of years. Soon, all of humanity came to think of fairies as evil beings. Yeah, I mean, that's... I guess they kind of... It, it's ironic, isn't it, right? Because the fairies are trying to save the humans from being enslaved again by the mages, but... But uh, the humans, I guess, forgot. And the Tower of Lieres is one of those towers. Elise, who called herself Anuela, was the daughter of Anis. She had the power to bring mundane objects to life. Anuela was the one that created the all the dolls in the junkyard. After fleeing her mother's self-righteous rule, she settled in the, in the northern mountains and there created a group of dolls who would obey her every command. They came to be called magical beings, and her art was promulgated by mages who idolized her. Uh, promulgated, I believe, means like spread. Or copied. Or both. There were two types of magical beings. One type was imbued with life. Another type had hidden powers. The latter were called artifacts. Artifacts had weaker magical powers than eyes of flame, but were simpler to construct. Creating eyes of flame was fraught with accidents, so making artifacts became the most popular kind of magic. Yeah. Yeah, eyes of flame... You know, artificial monostones probably tend to explode and kill people. Well, there's Jick. The King of Dragons, Argot, destroyed all the mage towers in the Land of Fairies. Argot opened a hole into the other worlds and called forth many monsters. However, records state that he was eventually turned to evil and was banished by the fairies. Argot summoned a worm in the shape of a flammy. He summoned Leucemia, the Worm of Light, and the greatest of all the worms. Legend says that Leucemia leveled each and every mage tower and died trying to swallow an entire volcano. This is a big freaking dragon. Right, Jack? He's staring at me. The Lilipes, here we go, are a small tribe that settled in the northern mountains. People said that they were similar to Anuela's dolls. Only Selva, who is tall and slim, oft visited 
oft visited Anuela by riding on a bird. Selva often took Anuela's dolls outside. The little peas, I believe, were actually created by Anuela. I think we're going to get into that. But Selva... Selva is supposed to be a wind... Uh, he's supposed to be a little pea. But he actually is more like a sentient wind chime. It's, I mean, you know, whatever. Humans are, I mean, he, you know, the power of thought changes your appearance, right? So he could be a little pea that became a wisdom and then he's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm from the four winds. You know, his shape changed, right? In a charcoal maker's hut, a little girl awaited her father's return. Her name was Magnolia, and her father made a living from hunting and from making charcoal. Selva gave this girl one of Anuela's dolls. Magnolia, that's the name of the doll that called us an artificer, right? The doll that was brought into Magnolia's room had red stones as its eyes. They were the eyes of flame that Anise made, and they burst into flames and burned the hut to ashes. Whoops. Magnolia lost her life in the hut as it burned down, but the doll was saved. The doll began to call herself Magnolia, and she stayed with the Lilipes until one day she left with a mage. The mage wanted to steal the eyes of flame in, in Magnolia's eyes, for they contained more mana energy than the enchanted instruments. Well, yeah, I mean, they were the original eyes of flame that the witch Anise had made. Anuela saw through the mage's plot. Wait. Is that supposed to be Magnolia? No, 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 no. This is actual Anuela. She left the northern mountain, then gave life to a rocky hill, so the mage's caravan could not progress further. The living hill called itself Gaius, and its knowledge seemed deeper and more vast than Anuela's. Anuela called for Gaius's help and prepared for war. What's up, Jack? You want to get in my lap? All the fairies fought on Anuela's side, using many enchanted instruments. The mage's force fell apart against the power of the instruments with infinite mana power. Anuela came to be known as the player of the flying contrabass and as the conductor among fairies. Why are you in my way, Jack? You know what, though? I am out of booze. I'm out of booze, Jack, baby. Why don't you get in my lap? Oh my goodness, you're so cute. So cute. My goodness, you're so adorable. All right, let's keep going, though. See, I mean, this is... It's like... I, I really wish they had a little bit more time to develop this, because I'd, I'd like this to be... more... more of this stuff to be in the game. Right? Where, like, more of it to be relevant. I mean, we've met Gaius, we met Magnolia the Doll, um, she may or may not be dead. It's hard to know for certain. Probably she's alive. Just because Eyes of Flame are, you know, straight up monostones, and she has two of them. Yeah, and, and Selva really screwed things up there. You know, and we learned about Leucemia, the Worm of Light. Anyway, Halcyat the Mage, Gaius mentioned him, was the last one who stood against Anuela. He used a stone called the Seventh Moon and fought against Anuela, but the mages among his army began a quarrel over the stone's possession, and Halcyat left the force. Right, the Seventh Moon was the one that killed Anise, I think. <clears throat> it doesn't say he won, though. Halcyat was the one that said, um... There was a mage named Halcyat who is not mentioned in history, although he is now. Um, but he is greater than me in many ways. Right, Jack? 
The mages made a magic circle with the eyes of flame and summoned the Worm of Thunder, Gamaswald, to attack Enuela. But the Lilipes lured Gamaswald into a cave and killed it. The leader of the Lilipes was Selva of the Four Winds. Yeah, those freaking Lilipes, the little egg, mud eggs with a, like an egg basket on their heads. Somehow they killed a freaking legendary dragon. How? I don't know. Why are you so cute, Jack? And maybe this is before Selva was a, a wisdom. It's it's hard to know. Gaius maybe at this point was the only wisdom. It became known to the mages that these instruments could be used as weapons. The mages took the remaining eyes of flame and the instruments acquired in the previous battles and fled to the east. There, the mages made instruments with more mana power and dedicated them to their new lord, Lanwe. That's right, Jack. You are purring so cutely. The mages provided Lanwe with their magic and urged him to prepare for battle with the fairies. Lanwe's army then progressed to the ancient city of Mindus to open the gates to the land of the fairies. Many nations use this as an excuse to start their own political battles. There is so much history, it is, you know, nearly impossible to keep track of all of, all of it, but there's lots of wars. Lots of wars. Whoa, excuse me. Right, Jack? Lots of wars. Rykrot IV was supported by Anuela and was given an army of wooden horses that could fly in the sky to fight against Lanwe and his mages. He came to be known as the King of Wooden Horses. Many brave men enlisted in Ry or Rickrot's army. Rickrot's army. Why do I feel like we're going to meet one of these Rickrots? The name is familiar, Jack. Gato, Grottos, Gato Grottos were Fadil's power nexus, protected by the spirits of the ascetics. Many monks fought as soldiers, and the high priest stopped enemies from other dimensions by sending their spirits to battle. Intense battles between the dimensions and other worlds took place in Gato. This world, this world is like Star Trek, where the fabric of time and space is like really thin and just constantly going between dimensions and stuff. That's Fadil. Rosiati was a hero who could pierce a warrior's chest with his arrows from miles away. It was anticipated that his bravery and skills would change the war's outcome. However, however, he only became Lanwe's general because Lanwe promised him great rewards. In the midst of intense battles between Rickrot and Lanwe's army. Okay, so... <sighs> Who... Okay, Rickrot... So Lanwe is the mages, and Rickrot is the... Jesus Christ, really? Yeah, Lanwe was the mage. Okay, right, so this is probably the fairy war. And Rickrot was the leader of the humans slash fairies. Right. And he became Lanwe's general, so he sided with the mages. Selva, in the midst of intense battles between Rickrot and Lanwe's army, Selva of the Four Winds brought his army of Lilipes and Flowerlings to fight on Rickrot's side. Lanwe then ordered Rosiati to kill Selva. No one had ever escaped Rosiati's arrows, and the chase was on. Selva kept commanding his army while fleeing Rosiati's never-ending chase at the same time. When Rosiati finally shot Selva's heart with arrows, he was surrounded by countless lilipes. It was then that Rosiati was told to become a wisdom, to walk the same path with them. So I guess Selva is a wisdom at this point, but that doesn't make sense. Or 
Because wisdoms are sort of... They don't really participate in the world. So maybe Selva died and became a wisdom. It's not the first time. Maybe it is the first time, but it's not the last time. We may see that here soon. Nunuzak was Lonway's best and the most power summoner. He summoned Freymold, Worm of Fire, as Lonway ordered him when the tide of war began to turn against him. Nunuzak kept summoning monsters until Lonway was killed, and he himself became trapped in the dimension on the other side of his magic circle. We're gonna meet Nunuzak. Another army to join the war was Ion's force of creatures of shadow from the underworld. These creatures of shadow, or shadows, caught and threw living people into the underworld and trapped them there. Olbon the swordsman went down to the underworld by himself and defeated Aeon. What side was he on though? I guess it doesn't matter. Freymold, the worm that was summoned by Nunuzak, flew across Fadil and burned Rosiati's jungle to ashes. Rosiati raged over this event and later joined Anuela's force. So maybe he's still a wisdom. Maybe wisdoms are allowed to interfere. Right? What's funny though is Rosiati, his jungle is not yet burned in our game. It doesn't actually burn, but that's what I'm saying, like the, the flow of time is convoluted because maybe it'll be burned in the future. But then again, the war is over at this point. I mean, I think. It's hard to know. Lastanak was the holy knight of Rickrot's army who was taught the spell of truth by the fairies. With this spell, he defeated Freymold, but is told that he later fell to a fairy's curse. After the war came to an end, Rickrot IV built churches and began compiling the Book of Divine Guidance. He also established the Academy of Magic with a portrait of the great witch Anis inside and summoned her spirit to it. Anuela was displeased by this event. Well, yeah, if you try to bind my... Oh, Anuela was displeased. Okay, so yeah, so... Anise's soul is bound to a spirit inside the Academy of Magic, or is bound to a, a painting inside the Academy of Magic. Rickrot. Maybe he's the one that... Like, maybe Reverend Nouvelle mentioned him? The temples lost many of their monks and priests as they came under Rickrot's rule. All the male priests were taken and sent to the Academy of Magic as magic researchers to lessen resistance from the religious organizations. In the years following the war, Rickrot sent soldiers to capture and kill off their surviving soldiers of Lonway's army, as well as the fairies, which he called the ones with devilish powers. Yes, yeah, so Rickrot turned on the fairies. Anuela left Rickrot and locked herself into a place named the Graveyard of Artifacts. So she might be in the junkyard as well. Somewhere. It's... I mean, who knows? I don't think she's Louie. I think Louie is different, but... Anuela created Louie. The seventh monostone was desired for its mana power. This is the seventh moon, and it appeared in history many times. Jumi were the first ones to be searched for the possession of the stone. It is said that an unaccountable number of Jumis were hunted down and killed for this purpose. Rajak. When Jumis were being hunted during the search for the seventh monostone, they died after intentionally lessen lessening the energy flow in their jewel cores. Many Jumis died this way to protect the secret of the clan, and mages began to call them lumps of dirt as a result. There was a new movement in the land of fairies as Zuf Ben became their leader. The spiritual waves of the two worlds were becoming magnified, and many expected the worlds to become one. 
Zuffben lamented over the human's corruption and called upon higher beings for help. Angels answered his prayers. We're going into crazy town again. And there's cat hair like floating in front of my face or all over my face because Jack is very adorable. Angels were being who ser angels were beings who served the goddess and cannot normally be seen by fairies or humans. Seven angels chose to reincarnate in the land of fairies, and they rode on Janna, a ship with its own consciousness. Here we go. In order to control the Janna, the angels decided to reincarnate into fairies and humans. The reborn angels would lose their memories until Janna could awaken them. Zuffben rode Janna and searched both Fadil and the land of fairies to find the seven angels, but humans attacked Janna, afraid of the flying ship. During the attack, the minds of those on board the ship were tainted with evil. The angels transmuted into their human and fairy forms, but they lost awareness of their true nature because they could not sense Janna's benevolence. Some of the angels even joined the battle to gain control of Janna. Janna turned to evil, and villainous people gained demands over her. So we have a sentient flying battleship. Either, you know, like the Talon from Final Fantasy Legend 3, or maybe like the Black Omen or something. And it turned to evil. Also, we have some... Uh, like the enemy, was it Please Save My Earth? Where angels reincarnated as humans? Yeah, we got this going on. Even though Jenna had not awakened them, six of the seven angels regained their memories. One cried for a fallen friend. One confronted Janna. One crossed swords with a former angel. One heard the guidance of a wisdom. Six angels' memories were restored, but the seventh would never awaken. In the dreams of the six angels, a seventh angel appeared, but he did not answer the calls of the others. He was neither human nor fairy, but a Jumi. Both humans and fairies has used the Jumi to strengthen their magic in the war. Right, Jumis were hunted for their cores, which are basically just monostones. The angels gave up on retrieving Janna and chose to fight for the Jumi. With help from the Wisdoms, they built a ship to confront Janna and join the war. The angels defeated the leader of the humans and Zuffben, who had become an evil fairy and sealed Janna in the dimensional gap. Then they remained in Fadil. So, the revived, reincarnated angels joined the Jumi. And the Jumi, the angel, the reincarnated angels, and the Wisdoms built a second ship to confront now evil sentient battleship Janna. And Zuffben and the humans had become evil, and Janna was sealed away somewhere in another dimension. Okay. As time went by, the rule for peace which Rickrot, Rickrot started changed to the peace for rule. The Book of Divine Guidance was used to propagate the Empire's religious and political thoughts, and many heretics were hunted down by the Empire's army. So I don't even know which of these wars was the actual fairy war they're talking about, but, but whatever. Maybe we're before... Maybe we're before one of these wars. Like, maybe the Janna happens after this time where we're at? Who knows? Irzoil and Anshalk was the 15th emperor of the Anshalk Empire. <coughs> <coughs> That's right, Jack. Okay, so Irzoil and... Anan Shalk was the 15th emperor of the Anan Shalk Empire, and he was called the Deathbringer. He was a descendant of Rekrot 
Anan Shalk, a hero in the era of the Fairy War, but his repressive reign called the em caused the Empire's fall. Okay, maybe that's where we heard it. So the Deathbringer is a descendant of Rickrot. So we're learning a little bit about the Deathbringer. And there goes Jack, so I'm going to grab the controller again. The Shiv Chivalric Code, which Rickrot IV established, produced many legendary heroes in a short time period. Julio Liat was the most accomplished knight in the Empire's army, and thus he was given the title of Holy Knight and became the guardian of the Empire. The Liat family passed this title down the line. Escad is a descendant. Escad is a Liat. To commemorate the souls of heroes lost during the war, Rickrot IV established shrines to the Monogatis and closed down most of the other most of the older temples aside from the one in Gato. The Halloway family was a line of priests, but under the rule of Rickrot's empire, its influence diminished. The clan of Windcallers could speak to and control the wind. They lived quietly in a village by the base of Norn's Peak and kept their watchful eyes on any intruders that might disturb their way of life. This is a little, I mean, I don't know how we got to them, but okay. Oh, maybe because of this. Urzoil and Anshalk desired immortality and sent his army to retrieve the dragon stones, which the ancient dragons protected. These must be the mana stones, specifically the three protected by the dragons. His attempts failed and he lost his life as a result but his overwhelming desire for immortality made Jajara, the Bone Dragon, choose him to become, become his Dragoon. So in death... So this kind of explains the Deathbringer. Like, originally, from what I understand, um, there was supposed to be a fourth arc, the Deathbringer arc. Um, although maybe not. Maybe not, according to this, if this are, these are some of the notes, right? made during development. Uh, so... <sighs> okay. So he was trying to go into the Bone Fortress, presumably, to beat Jajara and get the Mana Stone. And he died. And then Jajara was like, join me i guess and I'll, I'll give you i'll give you the immortality that you seek but you have to serve me in response that's kind of my head cannon um and so the soldiers that we see the ones that look like the imperial soldiers but they're they're undead the undead imperial soldiers i believe are the deathbringer's army because through Jajara, he has power over death. Or he can, you know, resurrect them or whatever. I don't know. There's there's a lot here, right? I don't know who the Halloways are. It's Yeah. Alright, so that was that was the history. That was the history of the world. It's a lot. It's it's a lot to take in. It's a lot. Okay. Well, let's go save because we've been playing the game and I don't want to I don't want to cheat myself of the stuff. But that's uh yeah, that's the world history. There's a lot of it. And I'm, I'm honestly not sure if it makes any sense. But it's cool. That's all. That's all. It's cool. It's... <laughs> you know, I mean, how... W I don't know what you say to that. What are we at? 1917? I mean, that wasn't bad. I mean, it's been about 50 minutes since we started, so that's... That's fine. World history, though, it's a trip. It's a huge trip, um, but it's it's cool. And we're going to meet some of the characters in there. 
I mean, we've already met some of them, technically. We've met uh, Escad, who is a Liat. Uh, we met Magnolia, who took on the child's name that she killed by accident. Or, yeah, presumably by accident, right? Uh, we met Selva, we've met the Lilipes. I want to know how they killed the dragon. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's it's neat. It's really neat. Um, but that is all for today, guys. Thank you guys so much if you made it to the end of this episode. Um, yeah, there's, there's no way I'm going to put every... You know, there, there's probably going to be no timestamps during this video. There's there's just no way. Um, but but I really do hope you guys enjoyed this episode. What is your guys' unique positive moment for today? Uh, for me, it's that Art of Mana book. It arrived. I read through the Legend of Mana section. There's so many. I mean, it's it's a few hundred pages, right? And it's just gorgeous artwork. Obviously, it's not all the artwork. Not even all. I think it's all the mana games, but it's not all the artwork, so. Still, it was really neat looking at it and, and kind of reading that stuff, so um, that's my unique positive moment. Hopefully your guys is just as good, if not better. Hopefully better, of course, and I hope to see you guys next time. Till then, guys, take care. <laughs>